thank you, Rahul, uh, for those very kind words uh, of my scholarly past and my activist presence and uh, for trying to see a continuity between the two. I thought the, another description for that could have been political schizophrenia, which is what I've suffered from uh, and have led this double life. Uh, thanks for reminding of the, you know, of the books and other things that I did some years ago. I've forgotten all that. <laughs> uh, and uh, very happy to be back here, back because I think about a quarter of a century ago I came here. I'm a very old person. Uh, 98, 99, I think that's the last time I visited Heidelberg and gave a talk here. That was, I think, on election studies mm -hmm. at that point. A um, lot of things have changed. Your building has changed. The world has changed. India has changed. And I have changed. Uh, but in one way, I thought I would make use of this visit to try and dip into my earlier self. A good Hindu should call it his previous birth. Uh, so I dip into my previous birth and try and respond to something which is an activist concern, but which has some academic scholarly component to that. When I was in Heidelberg last, those days, that entire decade, I used to talk about the strength of Indian democracy. On those days, I used to talk about the democratic resurgence, uh, democratic upsurge in India. And uh, in my more excited moments, I did give the world a few lectures about how the world could be more democratic, learning from India. Uh, as you can see, I feel quite shamefaced about those things today uh, because of what Indian democracy has become. Uh, but uh, yes, those days, I used to think that India had offered a different path to being democratic and different paths to being a nation, a path other than the path given by Europe. Um, things have changed, and they've changed so radically that uh, someone must sit back and say, what happened? Why did it happen the way it did? Uh, and that's partly what I wish to do today make sense of that India that I used to talk about and the India that I live in today, Indian democracy. Um, the, in a sense, this is not merely an Indian question. You know, there was a time in the discipline of political science that we had democratization studies. We used to believe that uh, the global path is from undemocratic regimes to democratic regimes. And there were multiple trajectories of how regimes and systems became democratic. I almost feel, and I was saying to Dr. Mukherjee the, yesterday, that we need now a new sub-discipline in political science of how regimes and countries move away from democracy in multiple ways. Each has a very peculiar, unique trajectory of going away from democracy, just as they have peculiar democracy, tendency to become democratic. And what I say today could be a small contribution to that discipline, which is yet to emerge, but which must emerge. Um, the peculiar way in which India has moved away from what it was to become what it is today. I'm conscious that uh, not all the colleagues feel that something is wrong and rotten with Indian democracy today. The other day, I glimpsed through Journal of Democracy, where some of my colleagues still think it's business as usual in India. Uh, I'm aghast to read anything of that kind. Uh, because I'm a, no longer a political scientist, I don't need to be very polite. And I don't need to put 
straightforward things into very heavy jargon. Uh, I don't recognize the country they are writing about uh, in Journal of Democracy. Uh, something has clearly gone wrong. All you need to do is to spend 24 hours in India. And anyone who spends more than 24 hours and does not notice, I'm very surprised. Uh, I think it's reasonable to call what we have today is as competitive authoritarianism as Rahul has written. That's a very reasonable description of what we have here. Uh, in fact, I had uh, written in the week, you know, just after the 2019 result, I was asked to write something. Uh, you know, when you can't change the world, you write about it. So I was asked to write. Uh, and this is what I wrote. I just pulled out that paragraph. This was in the paper called The Mint. This is just seven days after the result. I said, so what's likely to happen in India in the next three, four years? This is what I said. Our political system would move towards competitive authoritarianism. I said, this is May 2019. Elections will be held. In fact, the occasional electoral affirmation would be critical for the regime. But that might be the only democratic aspect of our politics. Instead of being one of the episodes in a representative democracy, elections might become the only democratic episode, just an episode. Any form of political contestation outside the electoral arena, protest, civil society organization, dissent, will be systematically curtailed. National interest would be used to tighten the screws on civil liberties. The big media has already surrendered. This was 2019. Now we might see systematic pressure on the few windows of free expression left in the media space. Elections would be largely free of open rigging. The counting would be fair, but that might be the only fair aspect of elections. In between two elections, our political system would resemble an authoritarian system. For its survival and popular endorsement, this regime would depend on occasional electoral endorsement, informal regimentation of the media, crushing of dissent, ongoing crusades against internal enemies, and continuous military adventure. Short of that last thing of military adventure, I think it's reasonable to say that everything else is, has come true. Military adventure, not yet. And, uh, you know, you have to think twice before launching into a military adventure against China. Uh, so, yes, that hasn't happened, but everything else has. Uh, the question is, why did this happen? Uh, there are two readings, or possibly three, that I would argue against. One reading that many of my friends who celebrated Indian democracy have taken is put it in different ways, but it's a, it's a bad accident. It happened. Accidents happened. This was a bad accident. In a wonderful journey. Second reading is, well, this was inevitable. As they say in Hindi, yeto hona uh, Because of the logic would be that of economy or whatever logic, and neo neoliberal regime had to be fascist. You know, there are arguments of that kind. Uh, I don't agree. I don't agree with either of the two readings. There's also a third reading, uh, which is that, well, this is a global trend. Uh, crisis or degeneration of democracy is taking all over the world, and India is just one more instance of that. So why are you surprised? So there are, I, 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 while I see the point in the third reading, I don't quite share uh, the sense that if you see some trend, something happening in the US or in the UK or in France, um, it's bound to happen in India as well. No. Uh, even there are interconnections, but there's something unique to what is. It is only by understanding the uniqueness of each of these that we begin to see some general lessons. I'll come back to general lessons towards the end of my talk, but I'll focus more on the specificity not the uniqueness, the specificity. It is the specificity of the Indian experience that I'm interested in. And to my mind, uh, some of these general explanations tend to be on the lazy side. Uh, 
This was not an accident. The current state of Indian democracy is neither just a bad accident, nor an otherwise, in an otherwise perfect journey, the rise of Modi to power was anything but a freak phenomenon. The Ram Janam Bhumi movement, 1989 onwards, had signaled this possibility 25 years ago. That was foreshadowed by Congress's victory in the wake of Sikh massacre in 1984, and followed by Modi's victories in the Gujarat Assembly elections 2002. We should have known about the dark side of Indian democracy. And there's a book on dark side of democracy. This dark side of democracy exists. We should have known it. So it was not an accident. At any rate, we are no longer now looking at Modi's victory in 2014 as a single incident. It's just, there's 2019. And if you thought 2019 was an accident, well, even after pandemic, after about 5 million Indians have died, I think the data has that they will filter through as and when information is made public. But I'm reasonably sure when the data finally is released, it will be close to 5 million deaths. I can't imagine any way in the world where 5 million people die and people repose their trust in the government. You know, even if they died for no fault of the government, normally governments would be kicked out. Uh, but in Uttar Pradesh, the government won, won better mandate than before. So we're not looking at just one time accident. We're looking at a phenomenon. It is also not an inevitable part. You know, the readings about inevitability, I don't quite buy that. The victory of a Modi-led BJP was not the only possible outcome of India's political trajectory. The political logic of Indian democracy the economic logic of a neoliberal state, technological logic of the new communication technologies and networks, the social logic of caste system, and the cultural logic of India's own modernity still left open several possibilities. I know among some of my friends, especially more of the progressive kinds, it's a somewhat normal thing to say, what else did you expect in a neoliberal state? My answer is, my friend, I expect a lot many things. The neoliberal states can be anti-democratic. They can also be fairly democratic. They can be, they are, they are usually very unequal and inequality enhancing, but they are not necessarily anti-democratic. And the idea that a neoliberal state is bound to be undemocratic and become a Modi-like state doesn't quite explain to me why India did not take that path up to 2010, why it did not take that path even under Mr. Vajpayee when it was a BJP government. So I think we tend to be reductionist. Uh, somehow social scientists love explanations that fit nicely onto a chart. We love inevitabilities, we love the determination logic and so on. Politics tends to be far too contingent for us to fit into the, those logics. So I think it's best to see the current crisis of Indian democracy as the outcome of what I call a democracy capture that was at once contingent and determined. Yes, many long-term things played a role in that, and I will come to that. Uh, but those long-term structural weaknesses did not make it inevitable that India must take this Modi turn and that it must come in 2014. No, politics is underdetermined. Just too many possibilities exist. And that's why contingency of politics matters. That's why politics matters. You know. uh, we need to understand how a political leader seized upon a very difficult chance and converted it into a personal triumph and how it, is, how it is that he now manages to do so repeatedly. At the same time, this democracy capture could not have happened without some structural weaknesses within the Indian democratic enterprise. A student of democracy must focus on the conditions that made this kind of capture possible. The expression, why do I call it democracy capture? 
uh, rather than say authoritarian capture of democracy or crisis of democracy or as Charles Taylor and Craig Calhoun have called it recently, degeneration of democracy. They just have a book of Ajay Law. It's a very powerful book, I should say. To call it democracy capture is to remember that democracy is both the object and the subject of this capture. The apparatus being seized is democracy a constitutionally sanctified and ideologically legitimized form of government. The means being deployed for this capture are also democratic, at least seemingly so, by way of an electoral majority attained in free and fair election. Now I use the word free and fair in quotes, because free and fair at least in that minimal sense that uh, the counting of votes is fair. I say so much to the discomfort of most of my anti-Modi friends, and I live amongst them all the time. Uh, but I refuse to believe that. I, 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 I don't think Mr. Modi's electoral victories are a functional function of electronic voting machine fraud. I think Mr. Modi has won because people voted for him. It's an uncomfortable fact. It's a very painful fact, especially for people like me. But it's best to accept that painful fact than to hide behind EVMs and things of that kind. Uh, so in that sense, it's fair, if you call this fair. Uh, nothing else is fair. <laughs> Media is not fair. Election commission is not fair. Nothing else is fair in those elections. But in the last instance, people vote for Mr. Voted. Mr. Modi won 2019 because people actually went and voted for him. That is true. So. So the means being deployed for this capture are democratic, at least seemingly so, by way of an electoral majority attained in a fair election. It is to remind us that formal procedures of democracy have been used to subvert the substance of democracy. That's the point of this democracy capture. Formal means of democracy being used to subvert the substance of democracy. This subversion is not just an accident in an otherwise well-planned journey, nor is it the end point in an inevitable decline and fall of Indian democracy, something I've said earlier. So we need to understand the specificity of India. And I feel that much of the reading about democracies in general, and about Indian democracy in particular, has tended to miss its specificity. When India was democratic, everyone thought, all right, all over the world, people become democratic. So India is also democratic for reasons for which everyone else has become democratic. Um, and when it uh, started declining, well, we had things like populism as the explanation. You know, So we tend to have global explanations for these things. Some of global explanations attract us. I think social scientists love these this. this logics and so on, for reasons which have more to do with the institutions of social science academia, less to do with the world. Uh, but uh, uh, I think we need to understand the specificity. The dominant narrative about India fails to understand both the successes and the failures of our specific variety of this broad template called democracy. Uh, because before we understand the specificity of the failure, we must understand the specificity of the strength. And my argument in what I'm going to present will be that India is not a story of decline and fall. It's not a predictable story of decline and fall. It's a very unpredictable story of success and fall. And many of the problems actually arise from the success of democracy, or what was a, for a short period a success of democracy. And I'm interested in that very specific Indian story. Whether or not it lends to some grand universal theory, I don't know, I don't care. I'm too much invested in what's happening right now and sort of what can be done about it. Because all this gets triggered for me from a very simple concern, what is to be done? And for that, I need to understand what's happening over there. If we go by the dominant understanding of preconditions of democracy, namely some degree of affluence and widespread literacy, India should never have been a democracy in the first place. That's the problem with the dominant understanding. If we insist on oscillation of power within multi-party competitive framework, then the Congress system should not be, have been characterized as democracy. Then India should not have been democracy in the first two decades because there was no oscillation of power within a multi-party competitive framework. 
If we stick to the idea of an overlap between cultural boundaries of a nation and the political boundaries of a state, independent India with its deep diversities should never have survived beyond its first decade and made a transition to democratic nation state. Mm -hmm. The point made in the book that uh, you know, Rahul kindly remembered. Uh, if we believe in a balance between participatory urge and institutional depth, the point made famously by Huntington, then Indian democracy should not have taken off in the 1960s. And having taken off, it should not have suffered the crisis that it did during the emergency. And once its institutional fragility had been exposed during emergency, Indian democracy should not have survived emergency. The rise of identity politics, region, caste, religion based, etc., in 1980s and 90s should not have led to a consolidation of democracy. And once democracy became the only game in town and was buttressed by an unprecedented rate of economic growth in 2000, from 2000 to 2015 almost, 2004 to 2015, remember, it's a period of unprecedented economic growth. It is not your period of uh, terrible economic crisis which leads to fascism. It's a period of unprecedented <coughs> growth of welfare measures which were instituted for the first time. If that was so, Indian democracy should not have faced its worst crisis that it faces today. So I'm just saying that the standard narratives don't get it right. By standard narratives, India should not have been a democracy in the first place, should not have survived the first 15 years, should not have survived democracy emergency at all, should have collapsed in 90s, and having survived all this in like by year 2000, then it should not have declined at all. So all the global narratives normally don't get the story right. Clearly, students of Indian democracy need a fresh pair of glasses. We need to see the, Indi the democratic enterprise in India as an open-ended journey with no predetermined starting point fixed route and given destination. The trouble with democratic theory is that it has all the three. It has a fixed starting point. It provides you a fixed route. If you insist, it provides you two routes, or at the most three, that you have to pass through. And it given telos. Can we look at this thing called democracy by setting all these three aside? But I'm already anticipating the larger points that I have to make towards the end. The journey has its origins in a freedom struggle that stapled the idea of democracy to the goal of national independence. A point I think we should note that uh, in the first half of 20th century, there's very little discussion in India about democracy. The entire discussion is about national independence. And the idea of democracy is kind of stapled on to, to national freedom. Everyone knows it will come but you don't need to really talk about it. Dr. Ambedkar is actually the only exception who's talking about democracy as democracy, is worried about some of the things. No one else is. So it's stapled on to this. The journey, uh, the formal journey began as a joint enterprise, building a self-reliant and self-governing nation, along with the building of democratic institution for the nation state. And yet in this joint journey in which democracy had been so intertwined with nation state, that the imperative of nation building and state building began to take precedence over the requirements of building democracy. Democracy featured here as a necessary aid, a mechanism that allowed the masses to be mobilized, people's preferences to be ascertained, their legitimate representations, representatives to be identified, and fault lines to be repaired, all for building a successful nation state. Alternatively, democracy featured as an impediment as a roadblock, necessitating consultations, procedures, and consensus building, all resulting in a slowdown that could ignite pre-existing fault lines and lead to explosions. This is how democracy was seen. This journey developed into one within which we cleared the path as we moved along. There was no ready-made road, no given endpoint. What made this journey so exciting was that it was so indeterminate always full of promise and danger. Uh, once I called it creolization of democracy, the language that India developed, I said, was a creole language, which picked up things from the global north, but put them together in a language that only, that
that could be understood only. This is like the West Indian speaking English. I mean, I can't understand one word of what they are speaking, but it's English I'm told. So that, that's a Creole sort of situation. The democracy capture that we face today is one such danger, always lurking around the corner. It was there. And while books will be written to show and argue that democracy collapse could have taken place only in 2014 when it did, I think there were at least two, three more occasions when democracy could have collapsed in India. We somehow survived. And the trouble is that since we survived, no one will go back and say, actually, democracy came close to be folded up. It is not for the first time that demo Indian democracy had faced the real danger of democracy capture. It could have been attempted in the mid-60s, in the aftermath of Sino-Indian War, or the death of Nehru and the subsequent severe crisis, including famine. Mm -hmm. If it happened, every political scientist in the world would have said, what else did you expect? This was the most obvious place, but it did not happen. You know? It happened and nearly succeeded during emergency, being thwarted largely by Indira Gandhi's self-goal, when her overweening self-confidence and misjudgment about her popularity led to her calling the elections of 1977. Arguably, you know, so if Indira Gandhi had not called the elections foolishly in 1977, she could have easily continued for five, seven more years. Uh, judiciary had surrendered, media was out, things were stable. Uh, democracy, the story could have been over then. Uh, today we like to write those wonderful tales about resistance during emergency, but I happen to have seen it. I know what it was like. Uh, she could have easily continued for a few more years with that emergency and folded up pretty much India's democratic experience. Arguably, the intersection of Mandel and Mandir with the sudden collapse of Congress and the economic crisis all around 1990 offered yet another possibility for democracy capture. 90 was that moment. But as so often happens in history, two roads diverged and there was a road not taken. In each of these instances, a possibility that existed did not turn into an occurrence. Not that such good fortune worked to country's advantage. Instead of turning its good luck into an enduring solutions through long-term institutional reforms, Indian democracy lurched on from one crisis to another. Political reforms were either postponed or else the very agenda of political reforms was captured by anti-democratic rhetoric. This was the context in which an improbable chance was seized upon to mark the end of India's first republic. My sense is that of the three or four moments that I'm talking about, this was perhaps the most improbable moment. It is the improbable that was turned into reality. The more probable ones did not turn into reality. That happens in politics. Uh, what, but what were these long-term forces that were working? I identify four stories in the Indian story. And I'll just briefly touch upon the four stories. Four, four strengths of Indian democracy, each of which contained a weakness. And it is the intersection of these weaknesses that was exploited for this, what I'm calling democracy, captured today. Uh, these four elements are, uh, in order to make sense of this trajectory and to understand how and why this democracy capture has, has happened, let me map four different dimensions to the story of Indian democracy. A journey of democracy, I argue, required four elements. One, it needed people, mobilization of ordinary people. Two, it needed institutions, both formal as well as informal to streamline people and coordinate their actions. Three, it had to tackle structural obstacles, social as well as economic, inherited as well as self-generated, that could impede the journey. Finally, it needed ideas, both formal ideologies and popular beliefs that could serve as compass in this journey. People, structural impediments, institutions, ideas. These are four things. Uh, what makes uh, the story of Indian democracy, democratic journey, is not of failure in all these respects. What makes the Indian story interesting is that it succeeded in some ways in each of these. 
Yet each success left chinks, cracks, or big gaps in the democratic enterprise and exposed it to the danger of a capture. It took a determined political player like Mr. Modi and a constellation of events, uh, Anna movement and all kinds of things that were happening, to string these vulnerabilities and turn a dire possibility into a calamitous rea reality. Let me speak very briefly about these four. First dimension involved expansion. The dimension of people is a story of expansion. The story here is people's mobilization through the routines of electoral democracy. In this respect, Indian democracy was truly a spectacular and rather surprising success story. That probably was the talk I gave 25 years ago in Heidelberg which is basically to say that India provides a very unusual instance. All over the world, electoral turnouts have tended to go down. In India, they've remained stable or gone up. All over the world, uh, lower orders of society ha are also lower in voting turnout and political participation. In India, it's almost exactly the other way around in terms of gender, caste, uh, class, in all these respects, and rural-urban, those at the lower end of hierarchy tend to vote more than those at the upper end of hierarchy, quite the opposite of the experience all over the world. Uh, so in that sense, India was an extraordinary situation of mobilizational success. So it's not a story of decline and fall, it's a story of rise. But this success came with a cost. While the electoral arena attracted large-scale mobilization, the system failed to offer real choices, empower people, or deliver substantive outcomes. It provided representation without effective voice in decision-making. The centrality of elections as the principal and the only functioning mechanism for democratic participation meant that it became the sole locus of democratic legitimacy. In India, elections are, were very central. You know, when someone like, you know, when I first came to Germany to observe elections, this was 1994, for some reason they sent me on a delegation to observe German elections. I came here and said, what's happening in this country? I don't see elections. You know, in India, when the elections were happening, you don't need to ask anyone. It's there, everywhere on the street, on the, you know, your, your ears, your uh, eyes, everything can relish election. I can see them here. There's something centrality to it of uh, public life. Elections have a certain centrality in India. That centrality, however, also was a weakness. Uh, the result was that according According the sanctity to electoral democracy, without any securing of substantive outcomes, or the assurance of procedural safeguard, was a problem. This paved the way for India's own distinctive style of majoritarianism, based on communities. In this situation, electoral victory by any means became the proxy for democratic legitimacy. Election capture became an effective route for democracy capture. Elections were so central that if you could somehow gain this one thing once in five years, then you didn't have to do very much for the rest. That was central. The second story is that of uh, uh, structural impediments. Um, protecting it against structural uh, involved entrenchment. The first was the story of expansion, which created problems. The second is entrenchment, which again created problems. Protecting it against structural impediments. When India began its democratic journey, the odds were heavily stacked against its survival. Going by conventional understanding, this nascent democracy faced too many social, ethnic, communal, and economic fault lines waiting to tear it apart. Negotiating these fault lines was no mean, mean achievement. Yet, diffusing each of these potentially potential divisions also meant a disconnect with the potential energy that each of them contain. This disconnect also paved the way for democracy capture. I have uh, detailed descriptions then of each of these, of caste, class, uh, uh, cultural fault lines, how uh, India was actually a 
case of success in different ways, not so much the religious fault line, which came up, came back to haunt again and again. But in terms of caste, in terms of ethnic cleavage, and in terms of ethnic as in cultural, uh, and in terms of class, uh, Indian democracy is an extraordinary story of how this nascent democracy overcame all these cleavages and actually domesticated them. They were no longer a threat. But what happened? Uh, that's the broad point I'm making. I'll spare you all the details. What I'm uh, reading from is actually introduction to uh, my latest book, late two, three years old, called Making Sense of Indian Democracy. So I'm just right, reading bits of that. There's a detailed description of each of these, caste, class, religious cleavage, and so on. But the broad point that I'm making uh, is, uh, is simply that uh, insulating democracy from structural fault lines proved to be a double-edged sword. While it saved a young republic from sudden death and disintegration, it also delinked the power of these cleavages, of these divisions, from ideas like socialism, social justice, federalism, and secularism, thus paving the way for democracy capture. That said class divisions could be normalized. Caste could be domesticated in India. In fact, it was not caste that was driving politics. It was politics that was driving caste. Uh, because of these things, uh, while it was good news that you know, all these potential fault lines have been managed, but all of these potential fault lines also drew enormous energy. That energy, transformative energy, that transformative energy was also contained and sidelined. Uh, this is a longish argument, so I'll just uh, skip that particular detail. The third dimension of the journey of democracy involves entrapment. So first was expansion, second was consolidate, or what do I call it? Entrenchment, third is entrapment. This is the story of institutions, more specifically the story of the fragility of formal institutions that left democracy vulnerable to a sudden capture. Here too, we often fail to notice that this failure is premised on a success, the unprecedented rise of a powerful modern state. Somehow, while talking about all the weaknesses of uh, Indian state and states like India, we tend to forget that uh, no emperor in India's history could have dreamt of the kind of powers that a modern state exercises. I mean, Akbar, Ashoka, they would have been green in their face if they saw what Nehru could do. You know, no Akbar could imagine that he could actually tell people how to marry and how not to marry and what to do and what not to do. It's the sheer power of modern state, astonishing power of modern state. Uh, Ever since independence, India has witnessed a massive expansion in the footprint of the modern state and a steady accretion in state capacity. So, the crisis of democratic institutions is not that modern political institutions fail to take roots. Rather, the crisis is that outer shell got stronger, while the inner core of institutions, which required autonomy, did not. That is the striking thing. Uh, external reach and power of the state keeps increasing. Uh, the coercive power, the financial power, but the institutions required to exercise that power in any meaningful way never increased. You know, when I, uh, when I read the news about some American judge, uh, you know, getting Mr. Trump to where he should normally belong, uh, it just strikes me as so unusual. Or an American court, equivalent to what would be a Sessions court in India, says to Microsoft that it should be divided into two. You know, it just amazes me. Because I can't imagine even a Supreme Court judge <laughs> trying to <laughs> undertake a venture like this. Uh, and the, the point is that institutions that required autonomy, they never took off. So you have state apparatus that is simultaneously strong and weak, you know, very strong and very weak. Uh, that institutions were only formally erected without being provided the cultural, administrative and functional basis that could sustain them. 
The weakness of formal democratic institutions of governance shifted a lot of actual burden of governing to political processes and practices. That's been my old argument that in India, things that are done in Western democracies through institutions, in India they are done through political processes, which look somewhat arbitrary. But a lot of burden of governance is actually carried by political parties, movements, you know, practices rather than formal institutions actually carry that burden. But those practices too were fragile. Political parties are simultaneously a case of extraordinary success and fragility. Extraordinary. I mean, if, in, if you go in India today, there are, there are things in modern India that look as if they are 5,000 year old. Tea drinking, for example, steel, and uh, political parties. You know, they would look so natural that this is them, you know that they didn't start 100 years ago, they probably were 5,000 years ago. Uh, but they are very recent import, and they're extraordinary success, uh, all these institutions. Uh, at the same time, they are inter over the years, they've been hollowed out. Political parties especially have been completely hollowed out. Um, the hollowness of political parties has also been exploited by organized vested interests especially crony corporates and capitalists, to capture democratic politics. Mm -hmm. The institutional edifice of a constitutional liberal democracy has thus been in no position to push back a determined assault on democracy by a powerful and popular leader, which is what's happening. You know, um, you can almost track, as I said, because of a political activist, I'm mean, under no compulsions of being very polite or very nuanced. Uh, if you track judicial pronouncements, and if you were to link it to electoral outcomes, you can actually see a connect. You know, As and when Mr. Modi suffers some serious electoral setback, judiciary finds its, uh, finds its autonomy, mm -hmm. starts giving some judgments which look lovely, and then comes an electoral <laughs> verdict, and then you see a recession. So the uh, you know the sheer, sheer, um, you know the, the the capacity of the institutional edifice to push back against a popular leader, that's simply non-existent, uh, which has made this capture possible. The fourth is the story of ideas. Uh, since in my previous birth, I also used to do some political theory and intellectual history. I'll just read out this bit, which may be of some interest. Uh, the fourth and final dimension of democracy, a journey of democracy, is characterized by entropy. This is the story of the thinning and erosion of ideas that went into the making of the democratic enterprise. Somehow, democratic theory has never paid attention to this aspect. You know, somehow the assumption is that uh, just as in market, once you have demand and supply, everything else is in place. So is the assumption in politics that uh, as long as you have elections and positions of power, mm -hmm. everything else is in place. But that's not in place. Ideas play such a critical role in making and unmaking of democracies. So the story of India is a complicated story. Uh, it's a story of success. The success is that when people actually come, democratic, they accept democratic invitations they actually start participating in democracy. And after a point, they said, all right, uh, we've had too much of your English ideas. Uh, now that you tell me that it's my country and my democracy, can I tell you how it should be run? So, so in a sense, it is actually the success of democracy in inviting popular participation. And the trouble is that people do not come only with their body. They also come with their mind. They come with their ideas. They accept democratic invitations. And then they tell you, all right, this is what I want done with democracy, now that you call it democracy. So that's, that really is the trouble. Uh, the success of electoral democracy meant that more and more ordinary people were participating in the business of making political judgments of their own. Rapid strides in formal education, the easy access to instant communication, and the ubiquity of mass media has equipped vast swaths of the population with information and the self-confidence to arrive at their own judgment. Public opinion has begun to weigh more, as it should in democracy. That's the problem. 
At the same time, neither the country's educational system nor the media has enhanced people's capacity for informed choices. The mass media, predominantly owned and controlled by massive business conglomerates, has seemed more and more vulnerable to majoritarian capture and in a position to sway the growing power of public opinion in directions of its choosing. The social media revolution has intensified this process by expanding the pool of opinion makers while either diminishing or eliminating any truth filters that existed in the past. Under these conditions, a political actor that could capture media could capture democracy as well. You have to just capture media effectively. And once you do so, capturing democracy becomes very easy. Uh, about media capture, I didn't speak much. I think everyone knows here. Uh, these transformations in the field of ideas were accentuated by a sudden collapse in the elite frame that structured public opinion. Uh, that's a point that is normally not noticed. Uh, it's not just public opinion. Uh, democracies are held together by a certain elite consensus. High ideologies do matter in politics. And in India, we have a sudden collapse of high ideology. Uh, modern Indian political thought provided ideas that nourished Indian democracy. This 150-year-old stream that begins with, say, someone like Radha Ramon Roy and so on in the early 19th century. First half of the 19th century it begins. For about 150 years, this river actually nourishes all kinds of imagination in India, including democratic. It was an intellectual corpus that supplied concepts and vocabulary. It suggested frameworks with which to absorb new information. It provided filters to check truth claims. This intellectual pool dried up abruptly after independence. I can almost date it. Between the 1960s and 70s, you could almost say end of 1960s, there is what can only be called the sudden death of modern Indian political thought. This is, of course, a gesture to uh, Sheldon Pollock, sudden death of Sanskrit. I think there's a sudden death of modern Indian political thought in the late 1960s, early 1970s. Uh, in 1947, if you were to look at, if you were to draw a list of big thinkers, right or left, right or wrong, good or bad, people who thought big, had designs, who ideas influenced millions of people, you could easily draw a list of about 25 people who have written volumes worth thinking, you know, long-term abstract. These are political thinkers. All of them, almost invariably, political actors themselves. And in 25 years later, in 1972, if you were to draw that list, you wouldn't find a single person. It's that dramatic. This is just this stream dries up. I'm saying all this to, in the hope that someone would do research on these things. I don't, it's my previous birth, but someone should look up these things and see what happened, why did this happen? I and mean, my, my, my hypothesis is that it is the rise of universities which is responsible for this disaster. You know, shifting of political thinking from the world of political actors to academia has been an unmitigated disaster. The politics is too serious a business to be left to political scientists or to academics in general. Now I can say all this. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> see, I used to say that even when I was in academia. Uh, academic political science is no substitute for this tradition of engaged reflection, disconnected as academia is from ordinary people, their language and culture. So instead of intense, even if misplaced ideological debates, we have been left with fragments of political understanding floating around amidst the fossils of 20th century ideologies, which is what characterizes today's India. Unlike the freedom struggle, there is little capacity to adapt Western ideas to our needs or to create a new universal ideals of our own and to connect ideas to political practices. This loss underpins the sheer poverty of political judgment that informs our politics, the lack of political perspective in public policy now and the debasement of public debate. 
another research paper waiting to be written, Decline of Political Judgment in Contemporary India, possibly in the world. Ironically, this disfiguration of high ideologies has made possible the disempowerment of the people. The proliferation of information has enabled a higher degree of thought control. More vociferous and loud volume debates have facilitated fewer templates of opinions. And the greater democratization and expression of public opinion has led to India's democratic journey into a dead end. That's the irony of it. So these are the four uh, journeys implicit in this journey. As you can see, the larger story I'm trying to weave is the story not that of a predictable decline and fall, but of a very peculiar success that left chinks. Not all those chinks came together. This was not a unique historical accident that everything came together. I think we must give the credit where it is due to Mr. Modi for bringing many of these vulnerabilities. And this is what big actors do in politics. Something which is truly vulnerable and ripe to be picked, something which is not ripe to be picked, they're brought together in an extraordinary moment and time. This is what happened in 2014 larger implications because I remember I've given the subtitle of my talk today says what lessons does it have for democratic theory for anyone who is who may not have much interest in India but may generally have interest in democratic theory what should we learn I really think democratic theory is waiting to be rewritten in a sense I would make bold to say that genuine democracy studies have begun now what we had for the first 50 years was a little romantic journey. You know, what we call democratization, democracy studies, all these were nice romantic things where we, we were actually not looking at the real animal called democracy. Now that we have got rid of those tainted glasses and we are now really looking at that animal called democracy, can be lovely, can be nasty, but a real life animal rather than the democracy of our images. Uh, so for that democratic theory, which is still to be written, uh, three or four lessons and that's when I'd stop. The dominant orthodoxy on democracy presents us with a neat definition of democracy, a universal normative standard which allows every political regime to be pigeonholed into a democracy, non-democracy binary. It supplies us with an institutional checklist that can be used across the globe to operationalize this ideal of democracy. And so we have this checklist going all over the world. And it weaves a lovely tale of the nation's utopian transition to consolidation of and culmination into a finished product democracy. I think we must realize there is nothing called a finished product democracy. This is highly stylized and selective version of what has in fact been a contingent path that democracy has taken in a tiny but dominant part of the globe. Uh, you know, much of what was presented to us as democratic theory was actually not even the biography of democracy in Europe. It was an autobiography. That's a problem, you know. Learning from someone's biography is one thing. Learning from someone's autobiography is an altogether different thing. Autobiographies are very selective. So Europe had an autobiography of democracy, and we took it too seriously. Uh, now it's time to put it where it belongs, namely a tiny part of the world has its own little lovely story, which should be read, but not taken too seriously. Making sense of democracy in most parts of the world in the 21st century demands that this orthodoxy be challenged on multiple fronts. First of all, we need to widen the conceptual apparatus of democracy to include diverse ways, languages, idioms, theories, in which democracy has been understood all over the world. Democracy, in order to be democratic, need not look like Western democracies, can take multiple forms. Second, it requires enriching the normative standards embedded in the idea of democracy by taking into account the many histories and traditions of democratic thinking across the world. Everything need not go back to Greece. And even the Greeks had actually 
more nuanced thinking on democracy than we like to admit. Third, we need to expand the repertoire of institutions, conventions, and practices that go into the making of democracy in societies that are often quite different from one another. And fourth, we need to rewrite the history of actually existing democracies, both in the global north and the global south, to reflect their radically different experiences and trajectories. Thank you. So we have a fairly provocative presentation in terms of the agenda that Dr. Yadav wants to set and the extent to which he is at a distance from what democracy studies are doing today. So the floor is now open for we are we, we began a little late, so I would request participants to ask related questions together. Yes, Professor. May I uh, please. please introduce yourself? Uh, uh, my name is Larry Pehran. I am not a political scientist, uh, so uh, thank you very much for a brilliant seminar. I want to ask you uh, about uh, a point you made about the actors uh, in politics who talked about politics, wrote about politics in 1947, and then again, I just think Now, but the, your talk uh, suggested to me, uh, perhaps I didn't understand, so please, if you could make it clear, that uh, the same kind of actors, people like uh, Bhutto, let's say, Dr. Karali Bhutto, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, Modi in India, are engaged in politics and are also giving a theory of it. Also, they are the ones who are actually taking uh, what we more, uh, let's say, westernized people would call the prejudices of the ordinary people and magnifying them and giving them a rationale. So, uh, possibly it is the, uh, the academics with their uh, distance who uh, may, they may, may not have they may not have contributed something fresh and blood kind of thing, you know. But they, uh, they it, it is it is it is the other kind of people, who engaged ones, who engage people then on to do things which actually pertain to other people's rights and, and, and so on. Atahu Sen is one from a from small city, Atahu Sen, hmm. Karachi, hmm. but nevertheless, all from Mahadev and all that sort of thing. So, if I could understand that. Could I respond on that? Yeah, sure. Unless there are any related questions. Okay, please do. Uh, politicians, political actors think and speak all over the world. But there's a difference. They don't theorize all over the world. It's only in some specific conditions that political actors are connected to the business of creating ideologies. Uh, Donald Trump thinks, I hope he does, uh, I believe he does, uh, and says, and he talks. He doesn't theorize. He has clearly taken a worldview which someone else has woven and he's trying to actualize it whichever way he does. So Donald Trump is not a theorist. I would take him seriously, but I would not call him a theorist of politics. He's not an, I, I mean, he's not, he's influenced by an ideology, but he's not an ideologue. Now, what happened in India is something very, very unusual. And this is the difference between the tradition of political theory in India and tradition of uh, social, theory, social and political theory in the West. In the West, if you look at uh, not all, but a very significant proportion of thinkers, political thinkers, come from academia, or have something to do with deep engagement with academia. They need not be like Kant, just sitting in his tiny little villa for the rest of his life, but, but they're all in some ways engaged with academia, scholars. In the Indian tradition, almost all the thinkers are political activists. 
These are two very different traditions of thinking, which initially made, in, and when I say India, it is pre-independence India, largely, uh, which initially made many people think India lacks a tradition of political philosophy, because we were trying to basically compare, you know, the usual thing, uh, you know, uh, do we approximate to what the white man does or not? If he doesn't, something is wrong with me, that sort of thing. So initially there was a sense of, uh, India does not have political philosophy. Articles were written, debates were held. But I think it's reasonable to say that these are two very different traditions of political thinking. Uh, European social theory, which is an extraordinary achievement of humankind, not just Europe. European social theory of the last two, three hundred years is an extraordinary achievement. But its, its abstraction, its distance from politics is of a different kind. Indian political theory, which largely was modern Indian political thought, which did not exist before the colonial intervention, and, uh, which exist, which was a very vibrant tradition for something like 125 years or so. Uh, where, and that's my claim, that is what distinguishes from Bhutto or from Indira Gandhi or from Modi and others. If you asked me who are the major people writing big books, of whatever variety, right, left, whatever. They were all political activists. Think of Maulana Azad, you know, scholar. At the age of 14, he was the editor of a journal. 14, but he's a political actor. Gandhi, Nehru, Maududi, huh? Maududi. 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 You know, I mean, look at anyone. These are, these are Emin Roy, I mean, think of anyone. These are all political actors. This very, unusual situation of political action being anchored in high ideologies and actually being the source of ideologies because provides filters, provides nourishes thinking, nourishes political action, that suddenly dries up. It leaves you with run-of-the-mill politicians anywhere else in the world who are into, I mean, you know, again, you can't accuse Mr. Modi of not having ideology. Of course he has an ideology. Uh, but uh, sometimes, I mean, but you can't th accuse him of uh, being a theorist, you know. Uh, and this sudden drive, and I, I don't mean to say you cannot have good politics unless politicians are philosophers. No, no, I don't mean to say any of those things. Very often the non-philosophers are very decent politicians. Uh, all I'm saying is that the disappearance of this corpus of knowledge, sudden disappearance, has created a form of political action where political judgment has taken a nosedive. So I'm being asked to, uh, I'm being asked, so, so if someone wants me to write poetry and suddenly erases the corpus of poetry that I should have read as a child, then the kind of poems I would write would be very different from what I write now. That is the kind of thing that has taken place. And unfortunately, in the empirical study of democracy, people have not paid sufficient attention to, to, this, to this absolute, I mean, this is such a major thing that has happened in Indian uh, democratic culture. And somehow it's not been commented upon, not been written about, its impact on day-to-day -day politics not noticed. So I was just underlining that. Thank you. Yes, Peter. Uh, my name is Dieter Reinhardt, a uh, political scientist. I situated um, at the Department of Political Science of the South Asia Institute. Thank, thank you very much for your talk. And uh, it's shocking because you said political science is undermining the creativity of political thought. <laughs> Not just so political science, the entire academia. To invite <laughs> activists like you, formerly an academic, is very useful. Uh, so, uh, I found very interesting you said there is a need of a new sub-discipline, not uh, only studies on democracy, but also studies on degenerating democracy or, or uh, fragile democracy. Yeah? I think that is very, very interesting. And uh, I'd like to ask you through, uh, one question regarding the causes of the, de the degenerating democracy in India and the relevance of three points I would mention. The first is, you mentioned one precondition of democracy is somehow the consensus of the inside the elite. Mm -hmm. So my question is, how far 
dynamics in India against democracy is based on the split in the elite. What is the relevance of this aspect? Is, this, is there a split? And if yes, what is the relative relevance of this aspect? Yeah. Second, regarding ideology in Dutpa, I find it very interesting that, let's say, Erdogan, Modi, and some others are combining a technocratic utopia based on modern technology, digitalization. The Indian ambassador, some days ago, was emphasizing the digitalization of India for everybody, from the, from the poorest person up to the rich person. Everybody has a, 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 a mobile, etc. So this combination of the ideology, combining this technocratic utopia, is a very historic approach of Indian civilization going back to several thousand years. So that means the combination of this time frame, going back to the past and, go, and, and future, combining this, it seems to me that this is a very strong ideology. And the third is, I found it very interesting, this twin of BGP and RSS. It means to combine a political state-orientated party with a non-state organization. And I'm just thinking, is there any kind of example nowadays, this type of a strong organization, of this twin organization, BGP and RSS, a political state party and a, a non-state organization. Yeah? So these are the three aspects. And what is the relative uh, relevance of these three aspects? There are a lot of other sources uh, causing degeneration of democracy, but I'm interested in these three aspects. Thank you. Very relevant. Uh, <clears throat> I may have overstated the, uh, the, the, the disastrous impact of the academia, uh, because in all fairness, I should also note that academia is fairly harmless. No one takes it seriously. You know, what you write in English language, who cares? You know, so that's the only saving grace uh, for the academia. Uh, in my defense, I should say that I used to say all these things when I was in academia and didn't make too many friends because of that. Uh, <clears throat> the point about elite, I think, is extremely important. Uh, the fact is that the consensus of the elite of the 1950s the liberal progressive consensus that many of us today look back to with nostalgia. Uh, it was consensus of a tiny upper class, upper caste English educated elite, which was bound to fracture if democracy succeeded. So strangely, this tiny little upper class, upper caste elite was inviting the rest of society to the democratic experiment to an experiment which was bound to blow away. If, if that experiment succeeded, it was bound to blow away the consensus that they had built. This is what happened. The Indian elite succeeded and therefore their designs failed. In, and the trouble is, and the, re, the, the point about India's liberal progressive elite is this, that they actually continue to remain very cut off from society. This is true not only of the liberal elite, it is also true of the left-wing radical progressive elite. Their distance from people was extraordinary. Uh, sometimes when I think of it, you know, you read those uh, Russian novels of the 19th century, where the Russian elite speaks French to each other. And they are occasionally scandalized by what the Russian peasants are doing. Because they don't speak to them, they don't relate to them. This is exactly what happened to Indian elite. They speak English to each other, live in a world of their own, and, and, and then are scandalized by these Ram Bhats who have come there. Because they live in a different universe, they live in a different country. And uh, if you asked, as I did once, to a gathering of uh, India's top intellectual elite, when was the last time any one of them had read one full book in any Indian language other than English? Or when was the last time they wrote a four-size paper 
in any language other than English? The answers would be very embarrassing. So, if you have an elite in Germany that speaks to each other only in Mandarin and discovers that people who speak this German language are doing nasty things and are unwilling to obey their, their designs, would you be surprised? That's what happened in India. It's a very stylized, over-dramatized way of putting it. But that really is what happened. So, yes, that elite consensus broke down. Uh, it was bound to bro break down. And in that limited sense, it is good that it collapsed. You know, how can you expect this tiny English-speaking elite? I mean, it would have been a colonial democracy if that tiny English elite could continue to exert its uh, views on the rest of society. Am I therefore saying it's lovely what has happened? No. The responsibility of this elite, which is a responsibility that this elite exercised during the freedom struggle. During the freedom struggle, all our great thinkers read in English, many of them read German as well, and French, but they spoke and wrote in their own languages. They always maintained that connect. Gandhi's famous books were written in Gujarati, not even in Hindi. You know, they connected post-independence Indian elite, and this is what I was saying to uh, Rahul yesterday, that political independence was the beginning of intellectual slavery. Because the moment we gained political independence, we forgot our cultural, uh, you know, the, the fact that we were, we were, we were, we were inattentive to the fact of our being culturally heteronomous. And that is the true, that is really the problem. So in that sense, what the BJP has done is truly to bring the voices of the subalterns up. They have done it. Uh, it needn't, subalterns need not speak this kind of language. But for that, you have to speak to them with a job which was not done for 50, 60, 70 years. So I think it's an extremely important point that you've made. Uh, on Erdogan, I mean, I, I constantly think of Erdogan when thinking of Mr. Modi. I think it's a very apt parallel. Uh, also in the two respects that you make. You see, depoliticization or turning people away from deeper civilizational cultural resources and Technocratic solutions always go together. Uh, everywhere in the world, authoritarian rulers have always emphasized technocratic solutions. Technological leaps, you know, 30s in Germany, all kinds of great, wonderful scientific experiments about genes and this and that. I mean, this is very technology-driven era. Uh, the point about past glory and ancient civilizational glory, I don't know what the ambassador said, but uh, uh, I think it's a hoax. Uh, BJP has no interest in or knowledge of ancient India, of Indian civilization, of uh, even Hindu tradition. They have actually no idea of these things. They don't care. They're, I think their only interest is in the, is in the package. It's in the packaging. The substance, they have absolutely zero interest and zero understanding. I was checking with your colleague, uh, Anand Mishraji, about what has happened to Sanskrit learning in India. And I have deep interest in that issue because I think it's a critical subject. And he confirmed some of my worst suspicions that with pouring of money and so, I mean, I should not attribute ideas to him in his absence. But my impression has been that uh, all this pouring of money into Sanskrit studies and glorification of ancient India and so on, has contributed zero to understanding of or genuine deepening of those cultural resources. They have simply zero interest in that. But they're trying. They, it, they have enormous interest in presenting it to the world. You know, it's a, it's a, you know, basically BJP RSS is a response that you actually saw in the 19th century. 19th century onwards is the old story. It's a story of an Indian who's deeply struck by inferiority complex. Uh, you know, the white man has come, white man brings money, he brings political power, he's colonial boss, 
He also brings Christ. He brings Bible. He brings science. And you are awestruck. You don't know what to do. You feel such deep sense of inferiority. And as we all know, inferiority takes forms of aggression. It's, an, it's a claims of superiority made in an aggressive fashion because of a deep inferiority. Because Gandhi did not suffer from this sense of inferiority. Tagore did not suffer from this inferiority. Vivekananda did not. They are at ease. They can see, yes, we have this much to learn from Christianity, this to learn from Japan, this to... Because someone who's deeply confident can learn from others. Uh, they cannot. So much of this is actually a tale of uh, invent, you know, trying to compensate for a deep sense of inferiority. And that has been my argument. RSS is nothing but a political expression of deep inferiority, a cultural inferiority. And because of which, uh, you know, uh, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm serious, this BJP government is so invested in fire, and this happens to all the Hindu fanatics, they keep searching from some quote from some professor in some Western university. Doesn't matter who, doesn't matter where from, and as it turned out the day before yesterday, it was actually a big prank. Someone said, Mr. Uh, Yogi, should bring bulldozers to France in order to solve French problems. And the, U the UP government officially responded to this by saying, yes, we are being demanded all over the world. <laughs> it turned out within 10 hours that the man was a prank. He was actually a UP-based fake doctor who had named himself some mister, some whatever. Uh, but you see, so so... BJP government is more invested in looking for international approval than any pre-BJP government was. They are more interested in citing certificates. You know, so much so that uh, during, during uh, COVID, Oxford University developed an index. The index was of how harsh a country could be, how harsh and thoughtless a country could be in implementing the lockdown. India was number one. And it was presented by them as a success. <laughs> I mean, it was ridiculous. But the you know, certificate coming from Oxford University. And the manner in which Mr. Modi hugs all these, uh, all these uh, European and American prime ministers and presidents, it's cringeworthy. You, know, you have to be deeply, deep sense of inferiority for you to wish to hug these people who don't want to hug you. you know? <laughs> so I think this is a deep sense of inferiority that runs through this politics. Um, and there's nothing Indian about them. This is uh, completely, uh, I mean, they're, they're, their sense of nationhood is completely a German import. Sitting in Germany, I should not criticize German imports. But uh, BJP's sense of nationhood is a complete German import. Their sense of Indianness is a complete Orientalist import. So uh, this is an alien story, uh, but uh, it's not so surprising. Finally, BJP RSS. I think it's it's to be to be absolutely honest. I uh, you know a lot of people find it very undemocratic, anti-democratic, etc. Actually, I don't. I don't see why every political party in this world should not have something like this. Because politics as an activity uh, must depend upon, must be nourished by ideas and culture. Ideas, culture, organization, cadre. Who would do that for you? If you do only politics, your cadre would only be political entrepreneurs who come to you only in order to gain some political position. The advantage of an organization like RSS is that it supplied the political party with a cadre which was coming not for personal gains. Now, is that the only example in history? No. Political parties within themselves have created this division. Congress party. Congress used to have something called Congress Seva Dal, where these were not people who were into electoral politics, but who were doing constructive Gandhian work, who were you know, gradually sidelined in Congress and then turned into a joke. But there was a Congress Seva Dal. Uh, for the socialist parties in India, there was a formal organization called Rashtra Seva Dal. And all the major activists that we see, Medha Patikar onwards, they are all a product of Rashtra Seva Dal. 
which was created in order to counter the RSS by the socialists, which nourished socialist party. And the communist parties have always had this distinction. You have a Jyoti Basu who is for public presentation and to you know, give a nice upper class Bhadralok look to your party. And then you have a Pramod Das Gupta who would actually run the organization properly. So political parties have had this distinction. They need something like this. It is a pity that Congress of today and opposition parties today do not have something like this. Uh, the form that it has taken is rather unusual, that they have separate origin. RSS in 1925, Jansan much later, that they come together and have. This is a very peculiar, unique coincidence. But this structural feature is something positive. You know, because I, I think a lot of my friends say this is un undemocratic. How can an organization wield power from outside? They should be banned and this or that. I find it ridiculous. You know, every political party should have their ideologues outside the party. Every political party should have their cadre, which is not linked to electoral success. So don't envy them. You just create it. Yes. So we have uh, quite a few questions. Sorry, I'll keep my answer short. So maybe we now just correct the last set of questions. And we will rack, you will have to rack your brains over them. Yeah. Because I'll then we... Write it down. Yes, yourself. Uh, introduce sure. yourself. Okay. Uh, namaste. Uh, sorry, I think Hussain and then you, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As you say, the Panamapuri Hussain, you talked about ideas. Again, let's come back to your previous life as an academician. I mean, and let's come back to 1920s, 1930s. And again, we have a different competing narratives. Okay, one narrative was Gandhi, uh, and you know, this kind of Molana Azad connected Nehru, and dominant stuff, you know, what you can call it a Congress. Again, a specific discourse in Congress. I don't talk about Jinnah, early Jinnah, or Iqbal. The second one was the competing view was uh, Sawarkar's view. And you know, those ideas that actually had a completely <coughs> different image about India, Hindustan, whatever it was. So those ideas had presented an alternative worldview about how the nation state should look like how should be all political identity, what should be the criteria of inclusion within political society, and so on. So, I don't want to simplify it, but again, there are different camps, but if we can say, you know, we have two poles, that India as a written civilization that can accommodate everyone of different faith, and no, Hindustan as a country of Hindus. That is a majoritarian, and actually it could provide opportunity for those people that they believe no, no, they need to define two different nation states. So, but the the idea was that dominant. You know, just look at 1940s, creation, independence, 50s, 60s. Janata said was not a popular political party. RSS was banned after assassination of Gandhi. What's happened here? So when. It, Attraction to a specific set of idea emerge over the time. What do you think? What are the criteria? What are the elements that contributed to the dominance of and popularity and reemergence of the new version of those ideas? This is number one question that we have. The second one is about Am Admi, because you are the first head uh, witness of the emergence of the party. So I remember when I was younger. So there were lots of promising view about you know, the emergence of the third force in Indian politics. So now the Congress is not functional, now we have a party that can deliver, that can connect to the masses. What are the source of elect I don't want to call it not success, but the limited scope of our admin party in Indian politics is number. The third point that you raised is about uh, some of the uh, voices by BJP. But we had in South India political parties that represented ethnic identity. Look at Tamil Nadu, look at Andhra Pradesh, look at Telangana. Uh, even look at the caste based politics in Uttar Pradesh, CBS, look at Bihar. 
So actually, the specific class groups actually could use party politics to express their views and accommodate their interests within the democratic framework. So actually, we could hear the voices. Look at Lani. Again, this is you know, maybe something about non-English speaker, non-elite leader. This is actually the example much before the emergence of Mr. Modi. Why those type of politics have been replaced to not at one, but you know, again, this kind of the new face of BJP politics. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Manal. Um, I'm from Ahmedabad, Gujarat. And um, just to give a bit of a context to the question that I'm asking, um, I used to live right at the epicenter of the 2002 Gujarat riots. And from that kind of uh, personal experience, I have started my life into this um, state of India, which has somehow uh, influenced the whole national politics in terms of ideology. Um, I have tried working as a political actor in, uh, let's say, economic institutions that serve for climate friendly policy. I have tried working with international institutions um, that collaborate with. Um, let's say, non-profits in India who are working for these grassroots level things. Um, but I have not found the kind of impact, the kind of tangible impact that I would, I would like to make in, the, in, in this particular uh, space. Um, and I believe that there's a growing network of people like me who come from this kind of a space, who empathize a lot with the struggle, caste and class struggle that is happening at the grassroots level. And, but would like to work more, not in the academic sector, but outside of academia, as um, like political actors, as, as they see in general. Um, so, as someone who has had his fair share of contributions both inside and outside academia, um, what kinds of advices would you, or directives would you have for people like me to follow trans, uh, or maybe have a network of transcultural leadership that is uh, driving the force for grassroots change in India? Yes, I think uh, yourself. Yeah, my name is uh, Ali Usman Khasmi, I'm a historian. So first of all, I was reminded of uh, Govind and Ali's film when they're talking about the, the Indian elites and how they, you know, uh, they interact with each other. Um, but I was curious, like, you know, the is it the lack of language or idiom, you know, because the affective services of someone writing a Rath Yatra written by Toyota, um, and talking about Ram Janam Bhumi, it will, it has perhaps more chances of, of uh, connecting with uh, people at large uh, rather than mobilizing on the basis of, let's say, class question. Also, I was wondering, I mean, there is this kind of uh, uh, blind spot when it comes to the, the inherent majoritarianism with any kind of national project. An Indian national project is no exception. So, the, the, so there is some kind of inherent uh, uh, in the, uh, or in the, in the Indian, Indian national project, uh, which has been long overlooked. So in a way, uh, for the longest period of time, you know, perhaps Indian political scientists have believed too faithfully the idea of Indian democracy and its inherent secular character. So it's a rude shock when it turns out that's not the case. So in a way, what when Nehru was talking about the soul of India being long suppressed, finding utterance, so that's perhaps another moment where someone else comes up with his own version of Indian soul finding utterance, right? So, so what's the difference between that and how you know if if it was possible for Congress to you know to to superimpose this kind of a fifty-year-long uh, ideology, uh, this ideology fifty-long years? Uh, so from within that same uh, and from within that same democratic experiment, there was the emergence of this other way other kind of way of imagining India. So is there a possibility that from that now Indian democratic democratic model there will be a possibility of the emergence of some other form of Indian nation? Yes, Frank. Uh, so much has been said already. I'm wondering if there's going to be enough time for our speaker to address all of these things. But I want to go back to an earlier comment before yeah, I ask Frank. I'm oh, sorry, Frank Corum from Boston University. Um, I wanted to go back to a previous comment uh, and question and then uh, pose my own to you at the end. Uh, one of the things that I find um, 
disturbing about these non-political party cultural organizations like the RSS and, the, and globally the VHP is that um, they tend to incite violence. So, so my colleague here asked a question about uh, the relationship between the BJP and the RSS. I immediately thought of the Proud Boys and the Republican Party in the United States and, and uh, the, the, how that led to the insurrection uh, after the uh, last election. So, th and that's tied into this other question about, you know, the, the glorification of the past. And I also find it very disturbing about how, you know, there's this tendency to push revisionist history uh, and to sort of excise uh, things that, that um, don't sit well with the ideology of ruling parties, such as Mughal history, for example. And even in the United States, the VHP, I'm sure you know, um, has been fighting very hard to try and overturn this um, law that Seattle first <coughs> imposed about um, discrimination against caste, uh, uh, abolishing discrimination against caste, and I think California is moving on that topic as well. So um, there's this global dimension where the diaspora is actually very, very much involved in, in uh, national and local politics back in India. So that was just my comment on some of the earlier um, points. But uh, my question was more theoretical. Um, so if you would put on your theory hat for a moment. Um, I was wondering if, if part of the problem with, with uh, studying democracy from an academic perspective, and I'm not a political scientist, I'm an anthropologist who studies religion primarily, but um, maybe it's in the definition of democracy, because I'm thinking of people like Gankar who write about alternative modernities. Perhaps we need more of a pluralistic definition of democracy where uh, you know, uh, we can think of something like illiberal democracy, what Orban proposes in Hungary, as being you know, um, alternative forms of democracy that don't necessarily sit well with Americans or Germans or other people in the world, but yet they're there, right? And somehow we have to deal with them. And in fact, just the other day when Modi was in Washington uh, meeting with Biden, uh, one analyst was, was making the comparison between Orban and Modi and used this term, illiberal, uh, for what's going on in India. So as a theorist, as a former theorist and as an activist, uh, do you find any use in, in trying to expand the term democracy and, and, and as a way of maybe opening up a dialogue between these different forms of democracy that are emerging around the world that are more authoritarian in nature? Yeah, yourself, and then the last two questions, yeah. So, yeah, hi, my name is Shubham, and I'm actually not at all related to social sciences. I'm doing cancer research in the clinicum, but I'm really interested in what's going on in India, and it affects me personally also. So, uh, I really uh, agree with, the, uh, with your uh, thought that uh, a lot of intellectual and academic thought right now in India is in English. Like from my personal experience, uh, this year is the first year I read any book in Hindi for the first time. Before that, all the books which I have read are always English or some translation into English. If I want to read German, then also I read an English translation. So my question is, do you think uh, that if the process, the academic process or the intellectual thought is happening more in regional languages, will it have more impact? Will, have, will it have more impact on the masses because then they will be able to consume, like my parents. With them, I would be able to talk. So, and my second question, I think I'm a little bit digressing maybe on your talk, but my second question is uh, the role of new channels of news, like these Twitter, Facebook, WhatsApp. And this is kind of coinciding with the rise of current party and movement. So uh, this, uh, how's the role of these new channels of uh, news, like these social media, is responsible for the eroding of democracy? And what's the role of journalism, role of local and regional journalism in to provide fair news in regional languages? Because I see a lot of news which is critical of the current party. It's in English. I read, uh, I don't know, maybe there exist regional 
uh, journalism which is fair and uh, which is critical of uh, the current uh, climate, uh, political situation but for me I read the wire because that provides me some unbiased uh, news. So how do you think the role of uh, local and regional journalism is important and can help to save something? Last two questions, Ayan and Jay. Yes, um, my name is Ayan Mukherjee. I'm a student of anthropology. Arun. Arun, yes. Fine. And I'm um, beginning to formulate my BA thesis on, on the issue of communal violence. And, um, and we are, I found your talk extremely precise. Thank you so much. Um, I have two questions. One is regarding the issue of the, the you know plurality of the concepts of democracy. You mentioned or you described um, you know, Indian democracy as an as an experiment from the elite that invited this uh, massive population to kind of participate, uh, and you also communicated it in the way that you know the BJP's success and engagement has been in uh, speaking to the subordinate. Um, and my question then would be, were there not uh, you know values or norms or uh, kind of practices within this mass of India? that could be ascribed to a more maybe pluralistic conception of democracy that actually the elite collaborated with instead of actually invited them to a kind of homogenous idea of democracy that was developed only in the elite spheres. Uh, so was it, a, you know, was it more of a collaboration that, that formed the young Indian democracy at the time of independence? And my second question would be that you made this split uh, when you talked about the breakdown of the elite consensus. So if I understood right, uh, you, you charted these 150 years beginning from Ram Mohan Roy as being a kind of uh, a kind of communication of uh, Indian polity and politics in a way that was perhaps more embedded. And then in the 1960s, you call it the sudden death of modern Indian politics, uh, where this somehow gets disembedded. And I can also maybe read this as a critique of post-colonial uh, uh, academia, post-colonial theory, and, and maybe that's what it is. But um, I would just uh, be interested to hear a little bit more about how you are making this split. So how was it more embedded? You spoke about the politics of India today coming from a place of kind of insecurity. Um, but you also mentioned that uh, you know the, the colonized Indian was also extremely insecure and trying to communicate their identity, religion, language, culture in a global sphere of competing ideologies. And one may assume that the colonial time was a much harsher time uh, for the communication of a colonized identity. And you know we know Ramon Roy has said some very derogatory things also about Indian uh, kind of uh, folk culture and tradition and esotericism and the way that they define the Brahmo Samaj. So how different is it? Uh, but I, I also completely agree with your point about the languages. But my question is, is it just language then? Yeah. Last question. I I actually forgo my question because a lot of things have been covered in various sessions. I think that is a very graceful. Answer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, we have. Even Thank you. Time. I mean, yeah, since more, more. since no since since Yogendra Bhai is saying that he is working on a manuscript, I thought uh, getting all. Yeah, the it's more to Maria. Sorry. Uh, 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 thank you very much. Uh, thanks for this uh, uh, detailed, nuanced uh, comments. And you know, one of the things that strikes me, Hussain, is uh, how much attention people who live outside India pay to politics in India. <laughs> and how little attention Indians pay to anything happening outside India. <laughs> it's always struck me as a very, very... So in that sense, Indians are like, like Americans. <laughs> you know, the, the whole universe is this. So they don't, you know. I travel to Pakistan. Pakistanis know about what's happening in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. And, this, and no Indian can distinguish Punjab from Sindh. You know? <laughs> you know, the usual thing. Uh, uh, so thank you. Thank you for these uh, comments. Uh, um, on the concept of democracy, uh, yes, I think it's a, a better starting point to not start with definitions. Uh, you know, theory is a double-edged sword. Theory can make you see things which are below the surface and no one can see. Theory can make you unsee the thing which is in front of your eyes. Uh, that's the problem. This is a strength in the problem. Uh, and I really think that if we start trying to make sense of this uh, animal called democracy, 
without bothering too much about Greece and about Robert Dahl and about uh, all these things, uh, we would be much better off. You know, there is something happening on the street, people call it, there's some word that starts with D. Doesn't matter, let's, let's look at what they are doing. Uh, so I think uh, as a starting point, it is a much better starting point. Uh, this idea that we are looking at a manifestation of something that began in Athens, God knows what really happened in Athens. All these are stories and autobiographies. Uh, but the idea that something that happened in Athens then came and has a great civilizational thing, and I'm looking at one instance of that, that already colors and prejudices in many ways my view, uh, which I... Uh, which I so, as a starting point, I think it's a better starting point, a radical but better starting point, simply as an anthropologist. Just, to, okay, this is an activity, people call it some D word, let's see what it is about. Having said it, I would not stop and say these are multiple forms of democracy. No. Uh, that is what Mr. Uh, Orban would like us to say, that is what Mr. Modi would like us to say. But that's not democracy. And in saying so, I'm not drawing upon some ancient Athens ideal or Robert Dahl. Remember that this activity that calls itself democracy constantly invokes ideals. Ideas and ideals of the people, for the people, by the people. This has been translated into a million languages by now, etc. But this is an invocation of an ideal. This activity which calls itself by this D word has many ideas and ideals built into that. That is, the, that is the material from which I start building a critique, imminent critique, critique from within rather than from outside. And once I do that, then I realize that democracies all over the world try to articulate some form of popular sovereignty or the other. So I can draw these things because these are, these are, so I would look at things that call themselves democracy in different parts of the world need not have one common element. That's our problem. It's a problem of definitions. You know, we think that every pen in the world must have one common thing. If you think very hard about it, that's not true. All pens in the world do not share one single thing at all. Just try playing this game. I played this game with my students. There is nothing common to all the pens in the world, yet we recognize what is a pen. And that's what Wittgenstein said, is family resemblance. It's family resemblance. Democracy is family resemblance. Lot of activities which are related to each other in some way, which go under this thing, which have built into them in each case a certain imagination. And it is that imagination which gives you and me a certain yardstick to critique it. Not Aristotle, not Lincoln, but the, the norms that the actors themselves invoke. Mr. Modi, faced with a very unusual press conference, faced with a question that he had not scripted, had to say, in democracy you cannot discriminate. He had to say it. Because you know, he cannot say something otherwise because it would go against you know, lip service is a very serious business. What you pay lip service to and what you don't is really the stuff of, uh, is the stuff of ideas. So that's the handle of criticism. Uh, so I would begin with what you said, but I would not end with Mr. Modi. I would do something else. Uh, uh, which is uh, related to that other point about languages. You were absolutely right. It's not just the language, it is the idiom. Uh, but language is the bare minimum. You know, I mean, if, you, if, if, I, if I sit in Germany and want to make sense of German politics only and only through Mandarin, uh, I would be an odd person. I may be a very smart political scientist. I can become one. Nothing prevents me from doing so. But the minimum condition would be that I would need to understand the German language. And I would need to speak to ordinary people before I start my paper and write my paper in Mandarin. You know? Uh, when that does not happen, it's a very odd thing. So, uh, language is just the, I mean, I, I use the word language just to give you an idea of the extent of scandal involved here. 
<laughs> but even speaking the language is not enough. You can speak a Hindi which is so distanced from ordinary people and make no sense to them, which is what many professors and politicians do. Um, but that's it's about idiom. But so so uh, while language is necessary, it's not sufficient. It's the idiom, and more than the idiom, it is dipping into what you know Charles Taylor calls it social imaginary. Uh, you know, built into these things is a certain imagination which is localized, which varies from place to place. There is no universal imaginary of democracy, but there are deeply embedded imaginations. It is to that that you need to strike. And when you strike that, then you strike gold. Then you begin to convert people. Then you begin to speak to them. Uh, which is what the Indian elite has completely failed in doing. So the, the question about English language is just to give you the extent of scandal. That itself is not the only point. Uh, does uh, speaking regional languages, uh, uh, are they more impactful? Are they more neutral? Are they more secular? No. Uh, most of the uh, regional channels that I watch and Hindi newspapers that I read every day um, are rags. You can't, I mean, you know, the, some of these Hindi papers, <laughs> I'll tell you the names later. I mean, you can't read them for more than five minutes because it takes five minutes to read that whole paper. There's nothing there. Uh, uh, that's happening all over the world to the media. And the regional media is more vulnerable, not because they are in regional language, but because they do not have the minimal wherewithal and, and uh, capital. Uh, to be able to produce a certain minimum quantity, quality. Uh, so some of the regional things are very poor, however, some of the stuff being produced in Malayalam, in uh, Marathi, and in Bengali is, is quite, is, is much better than is being produced in Hindi. So varies. But uh, speaking a language other than English is of course no guarantee. Um, on the... Uh, on Oyan's uh, question, I think it's a very interesting question about uh, whether the Indian elite was actually collaborating with some pre-existing imaginations. Uh, they were. I make a difference between pre-independence Indian elite and the post-independence elite. A uh, post-independence Indian elite who comes to which comes to the university and starts talking political science. Um, has no imagination built into it, no popular imagination, doesn't connect to anything that's happening on the, on the ground. But in pre-independence time, in fact, my point is what makes modern Indian political thought such a rich body of literature, what makes that imagination such deep imagination and so worthy of such a resource is precisely because they were speaking to this pre-existing imagination. What is modern Indian political thought? It's basically an attempt to connect what they saw attractive about the modern universe, which was which came through colonialism. They were trying to connect colonial modernity to our civilizational heritage without giving up any one of these. Without saying, you know, all modern ideas are great, what we had so far was nonsense. Or without saying, like Mr. Modi ji say, would say, you know, we had plastic surgery in ancient India. You know, none of them would say something as nonsensical as that. Now, this is what made that idea. So they were actually very deeply connecting to the past. So it's basically uh, India's very own, very desi modernity. It was a creative enterprise. It is creative. Yeah. That's precisely, yeah. you know, what is European social theory? It's a creative enterprise. You know, what makes European social theory so great for any, I mean, I'm a great admirer of European social theory. Uh, it is because here are these people who say, okay, we are looking at something very unusual. Remember the phrase Tocqueville uses. He says, we are looking at some, uh, we are looking at an age where the shadow of the past has ceased where the past has ceased to cast its shadow onto future. So here you have people who are acutely conscious of the fact that something very unusual, hitherto unknown, is happening to their lives. And they refuse to take either a, they refuse to simply say, oh my God, what's happening? We are losing. 
or to say everything that's happening is great. This is a creative enterprise. What makes European modernity into such an achievement of humankind is precisely this. What we need, and what is so unusual about Indian political thought is that they are carving a very unusual Indian modernity, both modern and Indian. They didn't call it that. They didn't have the language of alternative modernities those days. But that's what they were doing. They were carving it very... I mean, if you look at... You speak of Hindi. I'm, I hope you are reading something nice in Hindi. Because the modern Hindi literature is absolutely outstanding. You know, uh, so much of what happens in Hindi is trash. But creative literature, because India's modernity arrives through literature. It doesn't arrive through social theory. It's through literature. And... Uh, that is where uh, this creative tension and creativity happens. So, um, yes, so they were drawing upon something good. And what happens in the post-independence area now is that this creativity dies. Either there is this empty celebration of great Indian civilization with zero knowledge, zero understanding, and complete crass and nonsensical statements of the kind that we see today. Or... Uh, the elite, which, uh, which for which you can absolutely say whatever happens in American academia, they would replicate that 10 years from then. And about an elite that you, whatever, you know, so whichever dress becomes acceptable in America, Indian elite, you can say after 10 years they will wear this dress. I know it. And whatever is taught in, university, in Columbia University syllabi, it will be taught in Delhi University 10 years later. I know it. That is the problem. This imitative relationship without creativity is the real source of problem. Uh, 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 Rizwan I just, uh, there's one thing that I don't quite agree. I know a lot of people say that, that this is inherent in the nationalist project. Uh, now, what you say has long pedigree. It's a uh, view presented, advocated by many scholars. I make a distinction between a European nationalism and uh, nationalism in colonial society, especially Indian nationalism. Um, what passes for nationalism in Europe? Uh, because in Europe, uh, the moment you've said someone is nationalist, you've already put that in a box. And uh, it's bound to be racist, anti-immigrant, it is uh, regressive and, and uh, parochial. That's not what Indian nationalism was, remember. Look at India. I mean, I know only of Indian nationalism much. Indian nationalism connected me to Latin America. It connected me to the struggle in South Africa. Indian nationalism led to Bandung, you know, coming together of all these countries. What is so astonishing about Indian nationalism is that there is very little racism. There is very little against the white man. You, know, you could easily, I mean, you know, our white man was dominating you. The easiest reflex would have been to say, these white people. There's very little of that. So, there is, so they, these are two different things which pass under the same name. I think we should separate that. Nationalism in India, perhaps in other post-colonial uh, colonial countries, countries which saw serious colonial, anti-colonial struggle. The nationalism produced by anti-colonial struggle is a very rich and positive ideology. I would not confuse it with what was called nationalism in Germany or in other parts. You know? And my critique is exactly this. My critique is that Indian intellectuals, so influenced they were with the West, that they started, you know, this is, this is, a, this is a borrowed embarrassment. You know, uh, Indians like to borrow everything. They like to borrow someone else's disease. They like to borrow clothes. You know, if Europe had fascism, we must have, what we are experiencing must be fascism. It somehow gives a strange sense of satisfaction of uh, a vicarious participation in someone else's life. Uh, I think it's a similar vicarious uh, embarrassment. It's a vicarious embarrassment. Indian post-independence Indian elite developed a similar vicarious embarrassment about nationalism which they needn't have. Nationalism was the biggest resource. Indian nationalism, it at its height, was never about doing anything against your neighbor. Remember China. I mean, India was responsible for getting China into the UN. Such was Indian nationalism at that time. And 
over the years, but, but it needn't remain so. Gradually, in a country, in fact, Indian nationalism at the height of India's freedom struggle, and Indian nationalism as is experienced today, are, today Indian nationalism resembles more of European nationalism than it did 70 years ago. And for that, I hold the Indian elite responsible. If you don't invest in an ideal, it will rot. This is what happened. Indian elite was so embarrassed. Embarrassed partly because they were embarrassed of being Indians, frankly. Uh, they were embarrassed of, uh, of uh, Indian religion. Uh, they had very little connect to Indian culture and civilization. And some of them turned radical leftist and Marxist. In fact, the leftists were no different from uh, elite uh, bourgeois uh, thinkers in this respect, in their uh, thoroughgoing modernism and their Eurocentricity. Actually, Eurocentricity is what defines all of them. And uh, that is what led to degeneration of Indian nationalism. And it is the degen, you know, when Indian nationalism is captured by BJP, it is not a natural culmination of nationalist thought. It is a complete coup, you know, which connects to the point uh, you know you had made about uh, uh, different. Uh, the point Hossein you had made about two imaginations uh, during Indian freedom struggle, uh, Gandhi and Savarkar. You know the funny thing today is we can say Gandhi and Savarkar. If you said that in 1930s, people would laugh. Who Savarkar? Savarkar? Who are we talking about? You know, the field of ideas undergoes such change. You know, retrospectively, today we configure that field because BJP and Modi is in power today. In 1930s, 40s, you know, the, yes, there were enormous contestations. But contestations about what? There was Gandhi. There were leftists. Within the left, there were democratic left and communist left and uh, humani humanism left. And there were uh, contestations, subaltern contestations from the uh, what were called depressed caste those days, Dalits today. So yes, it is a very contested field, but the significance and the spectrum is very differently configured from what we imagine it to be today. Mm -hmm. That's one thing we need to remember. These are complete loonies. No one took them seriously. Uh, uh, they, they mattered. We should have taken them more seriously. But uh, the way it was configured, they did not exist at that point. Uh, on the, uh, the they, they, yeah, ab you're absolutely right. Subaltern voices could take many expressions. It need not take the Hindu expression. Uh, subaltern voices took, uh, it began in the South. And the South India has actually led in democratic uh, experiments and radical democratic things, much more than North India. North India has remained more conservative than the South. Uh, yes, it could be the assertion of the lower castes, of the backward communities, of Dalits, and so on. And, uh, and, and yes, it is a tragedy that uh, the subaltern expression finally is articulated through this very artificial aggregation called Hindutva. And that is truly the failure of radical politics. You know, it is complete failure. I mean, you know, the uh, left politics that did not even recognize caste, you know, and that's why I said theory can make you not recognize something which is right in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. So they could develop, write long books about Indian politics without recognizing this thing called caste, which they encountered every single day. You know? So it's a failure of Indian radical uh, politics and imagination, which finally results in this uh, you know, RSS and BJP being able to take over and run with it. Uh, on the uh, elected, uh, on Amadni party, that's a long story. Uh, to my mind, now that I look back at it uh, from some distance, uh, I think uh, it is clearly a case of a problem of success. Uh, electoral success came too soon to Amadni party. Uh, and when it came too soon, the kind of maturing that a movement has to go through, it did not go through that. And it lent itself to a capture in a different sense. Uh, and people like me are uh, guilty, responsible for 
not understanding that moment and allowing that capture to take place. Uh, it happened in front of my eyes in the rooms where I was sitting, so I should take uh, some blame for all those things. Uh, but the con real contingency of politics, how things can be shaped, uh, that's what happened. And today, when I look at it, Amadmi Party uh, does not in any way represent politics of... Um, I mean, you know, in India today, you have parties which are BJP and pro-BJP, then they are non-BJP, then they are anti-BJP. I fail to place Amadmi Party today in the third category. Uh -huh. It's definitely in the second category. It's non-BJP but not anti-BJP in its ideology. Uh, in its ideological frame, Amadmi Party has accepted that its Hindu dominance it, within it is ideological spectrum provided for you know frame provided by the BJP is the frame within which politics can be dealt with. That they have conceded, mm -hmm. and in fact, the closer you are, as you know, in politics, in fact, being proximate to someone else is a reason for conflict. Uh, so its clash with the BJP is not because of distance, it is because of proximity. You know? um, on the uh, point of uh, uh, one thing I missed, uh, yeah, man of your thing, you said something beautiful about uh, I have had fair share of success in academic and politics. I think would you like to revise it to say I've had my fair share of failures, both in academia oh, and so politics? I'm, I'm sorry, I've only my successes. Uh, no, I'm just joking. Uh, uh, this is, uh, uh, to different forms of understanding how, uh, how tangible impact in the way I want in my community yeah, would be exactly. expounded in a much better sense. Yeah. So I'm an instance of failure, Manav, to be absolutely honest. Uh, failure both in academia and in uh, politics. Um, and. Uh, yeah, you can learn from failures and you can do well. Uh, so uh, I could probably give a, you know, uh, some thought on... One elementary thing I would say is this, that uh, if you travel in Gujarat today, you want to do something about climate and you are unable to have an impact, uh, maybe the one reason is that you are doing what the Indian elite did in the 1950s, uh, namely you have certain values, you have certain ideals, and you think because they are powerful ideals and values, they would, they would prevail. They don't. The only way in democracy is to sit with the people, listen to them, and then speak to them. Listen to them, listen to their own ideas. Uh, I would sit down with farmers, I would not speak to them about climate change or climate justice. I would just sit down with them and ask them, ah, there's been a lot of damage, cro crop damage of late. Ah, speak to farmer about crop damage and they would start. They would tell you, yes, I lost this much crop there, you know, so much excessive rain. And you know, last year for 20 days, there was no rain when I expected it. Uh, then you would say, okay, is it happening more often than it used to happen in your father's time? Maybe let's get an elder there. An elder may say it and say, no, there was, which is in scientific technical terms, the frequency of extreme weather events has increased. Once they see that, then you can say this is not happening just here. It's also happening in Pakistan. It's happening in Egypt. It's also happening in Lebanon or wherever. It's happening all over the world. And you know the reason why? That is the way. And then climate change emerges from those conversations. So uh, I think that's probably the way uh, that is unfortunately the only way and that is uh, fortunately the only way, isn't it? Thank you. So we've had a grand treat, not only in terms of the lecture, but I think Dr. Yadav was very, very sympathetic to all the questions that were raised. I will not ask him another question, I will just leave you all with the thought that how is there not really a problem of thinking of India as a nation? Uh, I mean, Gandhiji did not think that India was a nation. Right? So what, what, is, what is India? I think there needed to be much greater. Of course, I think there was a lot of thinking about how India should be. And the mo moment you fall into the nation state trap, uh, you can lead in that direction very quickly. 
and that requires a lot of creative thinking. I think there was some that happened, uh, not in the academia. The people in the academia who tried it actually did not get published in very good places. Uh, people wrote more about the state, and people wrote derogatory things about the Indian nation and nationalism, and they became, uh, you know, celebrated scholars. So I think, I think this is something that we really have to think about. This is point number one. Point number two is that, of course, there's a problem with the vernacular, there's a problem with social mobilization, but all of that happened. And all of that also happened in the non-BJP world and is happening in recent times. So it's a question of how this mobilization is taking place and has a certain vehicle of mobilization collapsed. And and, and, and you know you have you have just one national party in India which is truly national and that has a nationalist project. The other national party in India, which would render Savarkar as uh, you know to be extreme of being almost a foolish person, is has now inexorably declined. So while the spirit and the mood of India, which also is very vernacular, has regional parties ruling over a majority of the states which certainly means that the Indian nation is probably not like the German nation. Otherwise, you know, in a Hindu-majority country, how would this happen, right? I mean, there are 30-40% of people in West Bengal are Muslims, and they are not going to Bangladesh. The Hindu population in Bangladesh is declining inexorably, right? So there are enough fertile grounds for thinking that Indian Muslims do consider themselves to be Indians. Uh, they don't consider themselves to be anything but... I, I was having this conversation with uh, with India's Vice President, Mr. Hamid Ansari, Ambassador Hamid Ansari, and he was saying, why did we not go to Pakistan? Was that even a question? Because we didn't feel like we belonged to Pakistan. Now, clearly, if India begins to define itself as a nation in the manner in which it is, and if it succeeds, uh, these ideas of India will collapse. And, uh, and, and, and it will not collapse because there is not a social base. It will not collapse because there are not politicians at the ground level who cannot connect. But it will collapse because that organizational structure at the national level, uh, which the BJP has with its uh, you know, celebrated social organizations, uh, an alternative does not have. So I think this whole idea that Dr. Yadav talked about is of the importance of the idea and how you can politically mobilize this idea continues to remain very, very powerful even today. And uh, that is really where the struggle lies. And I think uh, whether it was in, I, I mean, I just like to end with this story. I mean, the South Asia Institute at Heidelberg was supposed to be an Indo-Asia Institute. Indo Asia Institute. That is how the parliament in Stuttgart wanted it to be. It was the Indian president who was a great scholar of the Hindu tradition, none other than Dr. Sarvapali Radhakrishnan, who said that you can't make it an Indo-Asia Institute. It must be the South Asia Institute. And when asked why that should be the case, he said that it has to be because, you know, India does not represent the culture of the region. I mean, the country is not any more a representation of what we believe to be the culture of the region. So it was at the advice, it was on the advice of the Indian president that we have the South Asia Institute in Heidelberg. Otherwise, you know, it would have been an Indo-Asia Institute. So I think there is a fertile soil. There are There is fertile praxis. There is also probably a lot of indigenous thinking. But uh, we have to think uh, much more rigorously, systematically about these things, drawing on our own traditions, and uh, use them as an elite strategy to mobilize. Uh, of course, through the vernacular. And also take advantage of the mobilization that have succeeded. I mean, the Dravidian movement, there is communism in Kerala. It's not like uh, recently in West Bengal, more recently in Karnataka. Uh, uh, Yogendra Bhai was just saying that, you know, the Congress had to win. Anybody who knew about the politics in Karnataka knew that the Congress will win. So India as a society has not transformed itself into a situation where if there is a minority community, it has to be banished. And it was some of those ideas, I think, that 
Jawaharlal Nehru was trying to express when he called it a twist of destiny. But the question is that the twist of that destiny was, I think, building on a longer tradition. Uh, now do we want to build on a much shorter tradition and create another twist? I think that's where the challenge lies. So thank you very, very much for thank you. such a lovely treat and all of you for such excellent questions and for your patience. Thank you. Thank you.